Would you sleep on your buddy's clothes just to prove they don't have COVID on them? People today pay to do that every time they cram onto an airplane. But back in the 1800s, people weren't quite so generous. In a quarantine zone that spanned the length of an entire country, peasants were paid to sleep on merchants' goods just to prove they weren't carrying disease. I suppose the gig was kind of like being a royal food tester. Easy job with great perks with the small chance you get poisoned. P pretty small. Probably. But a real flex for Labor Day, huh? So, who were these royal plague testers? What were they testing for and did it work? Let's find out. By the time the 1700s rolled around, the Ottoman Empire was in a state of decline. It sat on what makes up today's Balkan countries and the modern Middle East. Up through the 1600s, Austria had been Europe's front line against Ottoman expansion, the Turks having been beaten back from the gates of Vienna not once, but twice in a century. But as internal struggles beset the Ottomans, Turkish military threat began to dissipate towards the end of the century. But though the Janissaries had left Austria, a no less lethal threat continued to invade plague. Far from being merely a medieval disease, the bubonic plague and its derivatives remained a threat to Europe far past the time of Columbus. Quarantines, originally from the Italian meaning 40 days, were common in the Renaissance as a means to contain the disease, though were generally restricted to single households or at most villages or ships. Generally speaking, as the centuries progressed, Western Europe managed to better control its epidemics, though port cities like Marseille remained vulnerable through the 1700s, as shown by this painting depicting an epidemic from 1720. Increasingly though, plague epidemics ebbed, and the disease seemed to be confined to the east, where, at the end of the century, Napoleon's troops encountered the plague in Jaffa, killing many French soldiers. While countries far away from the east had to contend with the plague mostly in their port cities, Realms like Austria had to contend with a long land border with its eastern Ottoman neighbor, threatening epidemics to cross at any time. To give an idea of the porousness of the border, in 1678, 1682, 1683, 1707, 1710, 1711, 1713, and 1739, epidemics spread through Austria. Eight times in 60 years. That's like if COVID-19 hit America every presidential election since Jimmy Carter. It was clear there was a problem. When the threat had been merely military, the Austrians could rely on the military frontier. This was a loose string of fortifications and border villages all along the border with the Ottoman Empire, stretching from today's Croatia through Romania. By the 1700s, this border zone had a population of over 100,000 frontiersmen, called Grenzers, forming the empire's first line of defense. But this was a disease, not armies that were invading. Could perhaps this long line be repurposed? Empress Maria Theresa thought so. Building on the groundwork of her predecessors, in the 1760s she led a drive to transition the military frontier into a medical frontier. A grand sanitary cordon, hundreds of miles long. They would exchange fortifications for border stations that could monitor traffic across the border and refuse entry to anyone traveling from an area where there was known to be an epidemic. Drawing upon the Grenzers, who had long been the Empire's sentries, the sanitary cordon was soon established. Almost immediately, there was success. In 1765, when the Ottoman lands of Serbia, Bosnia, and Dalmatia were struck by the plague, the adjoining Austrian territories of Croatia and Slovenia escaped without cases. And then, in the 1770s, when an epidemic ravaged the Ottomans' Romanian provinces, it did not jump the border into neighboring Austrian Hungary. The cordon seemed to be able to work. But how did it work? How did the Habsburg rulers quarantine an entire country, an empire no less? Let's step into the buckled boots of a Greek merchant who wanted to cross the border to see what it's like. With a cartload of Corinthian wool behind him, this merchant has arrived in the Austrian border via Belgrade. This was the start of Austria's sanitary cordon. All along the rolling hills of the northern Balkans, the merchant would see border stations stretched out. So many, in fact, that each station was within musket shot of each other, with roving patrols moving between the stations to catch any interloper who tried to sneak through. And they meant business. If for a moment our merchant was tempted by dodging the hassle of the border crossing, he would have been dismayed by a notice that five to ten years imprisonment awaited anyone who tried to slip the cordon. 
That is, if he wasn't simply shot by shaky sentries. Timing of his trip mattered a lot to how quickly our merchant could get through. The sanitary cordon had three stages of alert that regulated how crossings were handled. In normal times, when there were no plagues reported in the Balkans, goods were quarantined for 21 days. If plagues were suspected though, quarantine times were stepped up to 28 days, or 4 weeks. And finally, if plague was confirmed in the Ottoman Empire, quarantine guard was tripled, and quarantines lasted 48 days. Unhappily for our Greek merchant, wool was classified as a very contagious good on the cordon's scale. This required his heavy bales to be unpacked and aired out. Employees of the sanitary agency would then be paid to sleep on his merchandise, and after some time, examined to see if they showed any signs of plague. Additionally, any letters the merchant was carrying would be pierced with a needle and then fumigated with sulfur, and any coins he was carrying would be immersed in vinegar as a disinfectant. Finally though, after weeks of waiting around on the border, the merchant would be able to enter Austria, his money smelling like vinegar, his mail like sulfur, and his wool like peasant, though it probably smelled like that already. This system proved effective into the 1800s, where, during Napoleon's brief takeover of the border regions, the French decided to keep the quarantine intact in its entirety. In 1813, yet another plague broke out in Serbia that, again, failed to cross into Austria. The cordon's success seemed to continue. Gradually though, non-medical considerations began to weigh on the system. As one may imagine from the experience of our Greek merchant, the requirement to wait up to a month and a half in quarantine was onerous to free trade, causing even faraway merchants in London to complain. In 1851, the countries of Europe met together to decide on common measures that would be taken against plague, cholera, and yellow fever, as a sort of proto-World Health Organization. Pushed largely by English merchants, anti-quarantine views began to gain currency. Quarantines were simply seen as too inconvenient, especially by those who didn't feel it was their life on the line. In 1857, Austria's medical cordon was finally dismantled, rounding out Maria Theresa's original vision after about a century of effective medical defense. The overall effectiveness of the sanitary cordon is still debated to this day, but given the evidence that several plagues were indeed halted at the Austrian border, it is difficult to dismiss it completely as mere monarchical overreach. It remains one of the longest quarantines in scale and time in history, and gave many a poor German Grenzer a chance for a comfy night's rest on some soft Greek wool. Hopefully, his luck holds out another night. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'm trying to get a history story out every week now, so if you like to hear these tidbits, please subscribe. And let me know in the comments if you would rather be a royal food tester or a border merchandise sleeper.